everybody. Welcome to today. Super excited to have our next, I'm going to say interview. Uh, this would be probably a roundtable panel discussion. Um, Do you live virtual sessions have had to have a remake in obviously 2020 and heading into 2021? Because in case you didn't know, there's a global pandemic going on and we typically get together in person for a rather large event. But unfortunately, we're doing the best that we can. And this next individual, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. I've been following him. Um, I don't know how long ago, Chris, you started the show, but he has the Chris Gunther Show on Facebook, interviews a lot of local personalities, um, covers a number of athletic events, passion of yours that we're going to get into in a moment, and lands a ton of celebrity interviews with like people like Chris <laughs> Broussard, who maybe you just don't know how good they are, right, Chris? And then uh, <laughs> MC Light, Lamar Odom, a, a ton of other individuals that you've interviewed over the over the course of your your time of the Chris Gunther show. So we're going to get into talking about um, Chris's aspirations and ambitions for creating the Facebook Live show, how he's gone about landing the uh, celebrity guests. Um, and all sorts of other fun stuff. So first and foremost, Chris, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me, Dennis. How you doing? I'm doing really well. And how's it feel to sit on the other side of the microphone? You've done all the interviewing. So now how's it feel to be the guy that's getting interviewed? It always feels a little awkward because I'm like, man, this is what I do. But the fact that I'm on this side is actually kind of, you know, cool. But doesn't nothing takes away from me interviewing somebody else, though, man. I love it. Right on, and I'm gonna I'm gonna dig a little bit deeper now. I think you're a Do Your Live alum. Yeah. So what happened was it was back in 2018. Uh, Miss Miss Jackson, who you know, y'all know, I love I love Miss Jackson. She had reached out to me about coming down, so I was like, all right. So I came down under the assumption that I was going to be conducting some interviews, and I did not conduct one interview that entire day. So I was like, oh man. What? But yeah, that's what happened. What ha why, did, why didn't you do any interviews that day? Did we screw up? Did we did what happened there? Did well, what happened was I had showed up and you know she had pitched me the idea of coming down and talking to yourself and some of the speakers. So I was like, all right, great. But when I got there, nobody knew who I was. So not only did they not know who I was, but I think they thought I was still in college at the time and I had already graduated. So it's in a sense, it felt like I was volunteering for the day. Oh, no kidding. I didn't realize that. Oh, it's all right. You know, it was years back. But yeah, that's that's kind of how I got introduced. That's how I got introduced to, you know, this entire digital marketing platform and it was everything that you guys do. And then did, did you have the show at that point? I did. I was uh, actually that was I think I was about two months into production at, at that time. So I was still relatively, you know, new. My show originated when I was in college. But once I graduated, I didn't want to just stop. So I wanted to continue on with it. And that's what I did. So let's talk a little bit about your background real quick. Let's give some context to the, the Do You Live Nation and also to our viewers on Facebook Live. Tell us a little bit about you, your background, where you went to school. Um, that sort of thing. I went to school. Uh, so do you guys want like my entire background or just from like <laughs> high school to college? <laughs> uh, I one time had an opportunity to meet Martha Stewart and it was kind of a weird situation because it was in healthcare and she was like, um, she's like, tell me about yourself. And I was like, well, when I was three, my mom, you know, so she's like, no, not that far back. <laughs> I got you, man. Well, like, a, uh, so uh, to everybody watching this, thank you guys for watching. Uh, definitely be sure that you like and subscribe to the do yo uh, page. They would greatly appreciate it. And, yeah, you know, thank you. It's no, no problem, man. So hi everybody. I'm Chris Gunther, a uh, native of the South side of Youngstown, Ohio. Uh, graduate of Youngstown State University, where my major was telecommunications and I minored in regular communications. And when I was there, I was, believe it or not, my first few weeks, I was extremely quiet. Nobody really knew who I was. I didn't really talk a whole lot. But then I got introduced to Kenny Reyes. And, you know, Kenny was the head of Rookery Radio at, yep. at that time. And there was a class that we were in where we went to the actual radio station. So I go in there and I said, man, this is pretty cool. And, you know, we got a chance to talk a little bit on the air and I met Kenny right after. And he had, you know, told me if you and your co-host at the time could come up with some type of idea for a show you guys could start. 
And that's how it all began. And so it all began right then and uh, right then and there. And I just wanted to continue to build on. So during college, I interviewed a lot of celebrities even back then. So I was interviewing celebrities in college while also covering a little bit of the men and women's basketball team, along with the football team, too. So I was covering sports. I was doing my show and I was doing all at the same time. And so be- before we jump into kind of the genesis of you wanting to start it, you obviously got the interest and you got the bug um, from from Kenny, who actually DJed at Do You Live in, in year number one. So we always wanted to have that music aspect uh, to it. And and he was there in year one. And, and I, I'm pretty sure that Jayetta introduced me to to Kenny to get him here. So she's been obviously always a big um big fan and a big part of, of what we do in connecting individuals for the conference. Um, you've got a big passion for covering athletics and primarily basketball. When did, when did you get the, when did you get the love of basketball? When I was really young, you know, my dad used to, what he did was for Christmas, he got us a basketball hoop that I actually still have till this day. Nice. And yeah, you know, mind you, that's like over 20 something years ago. But when we were younger, we used to always shoot on the hoops. And I said, this is what I want to do. So I played basketball my entire life. But what I also did was I love watching a sports center. You know, I love watching the late great Stuart Scott, love watching Chris Broussard, and I love watching Stephen A. Smith. And as I got older, I just love basketball and I love the people that talked about it. And when I was in high school, I said, this is what I really want to do. So that's how my love for the game of basketball began when I was younger. But my love for talking about basketball, it was always there. It just had to grow a little more. Once I got to high school, I said, this is what I really want to do. Now, do you, are you the best? This, this, this is a little bit of a, a loaded question. Is mm-hmm. that it? Okay. Are you the best Facebook Live personality and basketball player in Youngstown, Ohio? Of course. <laughs> of course. There, there is no if, ands, or buts about that one. Now, you know who's second best? Who's that? Me. I mean, well, somebody got to come in second place, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that's an age thing, too. I'm going to hide behind the age. So you don't, you probably don't, you probably don't know this about my background. I too have a, a very shared passion with you. I absolutely fell in love with basketball at a very young age. Love it. My neighbor said, my neighbor will watch me throw a baseball up against the wall. And then I just go pick up the basketball. And, shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> and, he, and he'd yell at me all the time. He's like, put the ba- basketball down. You're too small. You got to play <laughs> baseball. And of course you tell a little guy, like you can't do this, right? Mm-hmm. I'm watch me. I'm going to show you. So from the time that I was 12 or 13 years old, I picked a basketball up every day and told myself in my mind, I'm going to play college basketball. And the goal, mm-hmm. the goal was real high. It was Duke. Right. Oh yeah, ended, Coach K. And it ended up, it ended up that um, I had to go to junior college route. And I ended up playing Division two college basketball. And when it was all said and done, there was some scholarship money involved, and and uh, you know, just a great experience playing four years of college basketball. And then I coached it for three years, thinking that was going to actually be my career. So I, I too, have shared that that same passion for hoops. Um, love it man you know it's just it it, it it never leaves you you know it never leaves you it doesn't and and what it did is i grew up in lowville and so the minute i got my driver's license and then now i'm a few years older than you <laughs> <laughs> i love it man i love it i'm a few years older but um back then you know there were still guys playing in the parks open gyms and i was all over youngstown mm-hmm. right and as the minute I was 16 and able, able to like get into different neighborhoods and, you know, it really expanded my horizon early on, you know, growing up in Lowville, everybody was kind of like me, right? Like it was like mm-hmm. the one joke is like, there was one kid on our block that wasn't Italian. He was, he was like Irish Italian. So like, <laughs> <laughs> so like it, it, it exposed me. And then obviously college did as well. And I, I am forever grateful because I don't know that I would have went to college if it wasn't an opportunity to continue on with my athletic career and it's what focused me to stay driven to, to, to continue on with that degree. And then it was around my junior senior year that I realized that I wasn't meant going on to the NBA. (laughs) (laughs) 
I think everybody had that wake up call. Like, okay, maybe I'm not going to go pro, but there's still something I could be really good at. <laughs> right. And so then, so then you, um, you know, you, you had a good career at Ursuline high school. Sure did. And, and then you move on from there and at YSU, um, I know that you organize a lot of open gyms, which mm-hmm. probably keeps guys really, you know, and, and as that, by the way, is that, that's not something that you've been able to do through COVID has it? Unfortunately, no. And that's one of the things that I really wish COVID, you know, would just go away because of, because I can get back to doing that. And I loved having the open gyms, you know, I, I loved it because it was a way to bring the community out. It was a way to, you know, provide that safe haven. And the game of basketball can really bring connections. Sports in general can bring connections, but it's just something about the game of basketball. So, unfortunately, we weren't able to continue it due to COVID. But God knows I'm working extremely hard to change that narrative soon. Very, very soon. Let's just say that. Yeah, no doubt, man. And uh, and I hope that you do and whatever I can do to to help along the way. You know, be glad to do it. I'm not going to cure COVID anytime soon, but... Um, you know, whatever I could do <laughs> now. <laughs> so, um, so now you, you start to, you, you come out of college and you start to develop this idea of Facebook live, the Chris Gunther show. Mm-hmm. What, what was some of the planning process, thought process, um, ideation behind that? Was there an end game in mind? Talk to me a little bit about coming up with this, this idea for, for your show. Right after I graduated, I got selected to come do media coverage for the Stellar Awards. And the Stellars is one of the biggest award shows in gospel entertainment. It's like the Grammys for gospel. So I get invited to go out there. And, you know, I can't bring that story up without bringing up Kenny because Kenny went out there with me. You know, and Kenny is just one of the greatest human beings on the planet. So Kenny, you know, went out there with me. And I interviewed a bunch of celebrities, you know, from uh, just, man, it was a bunch of them. Like, I I can't even go into all the names because I'm probably going to miss a couple. But I did that. And then I came back home and said, there's no way I can let this momentum go. Like, I have to keep this going. Yeah. And I at that time, I was just trying to do radio. So I had applied to different radio stations and tried to get in TV a little bit. But nobody gave me a chance. And I'm the kind of person where I say, you know what? If they're not going to give me a chance, I'm just going to create something. So what I did was I contacted the Honorable Judge Carla Baldwin, who is definitely an auntie. So I called up Auntie Carla, and she was my first interview that I did from the Chris Gunther show. And from that point on, I said, I got something pretty special. So I was doing a couple things with local people, and I want to say it was by my third interview. I think I reached, I want to say it was between 1,000 and 1,300 views. And when that happens really quick, you start thinking, okay, maybe I do have something special here. And I just wanted to keep building and keep going and keep grinding in hopes that it could land me a job in the field. And once I got my foot into the door somewhere, it I kind of quickly discovered why sometimes in life you may want something so bad. And then you get there and you realize it's not what I thought it would be. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what I had to learn quickly was I'm just a different breed. I'm, I'm just cut from a different cloth. And, you know, without going into all of the details, I did get in with a TV station. It just wasn't the right fit. wasn't the right time. They tried to make me out to be something that I wasn't. But I was still doing my show on the side because that's how I got in there was from doing my own uh, show. And ultimately, you know, we parted ways. It was sooner than expected, but we parted ways. But even though we parted ways, my mindset was I'm not stopping anything. I'm just going to keep going and keep growing. And now here I am still interviewing celebrities till this day. How many interviews do you think you've done? Well over 200. Well over 200. I'm probably, and it's funny you asked that because I was thinking to myself, man, how many have I done? I want to say I'm, I think I'm flirting around 250 right now. I could be between 250 and 300. Once I hit the 300 mark, I'll be like, oh, snap, I really did 300 of these things. Primarily on Facebook Live. Primarily interviews on Facebook Live. How many have I done? Um, No, I mean, I mean, no, 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 no. Like your show is, 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 is just Facebook Live. You don't, you're not like podcast or linkedin or instagram like you you leverage facebook live as your place as your go-to to to conduct your interviews i leverage it on facebook live but then there's also youtube that i post my shows on too and i did post them uh significantly on linkedin as well so from instagram 
YouTube, LinkedIn, and Facebook. But the most traction I got was was, was obviously from Facebook because that's where I uh, started at. And, you know, I've always been under the mindset, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. So I, I'm always amazed when I reach out to people and a lot of times there's a Youngstown tie to it. And I talk to them about the poor me do your life story about, <laughs> hey, we're trying to do something good in the city of Youngstown. And, and I get a lot, I get a lot, I'm always surprised at the feedback that I get. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's always shocking and humbling at the same time. Now, how does a guy from Youngstown, Ohio, end up with Lamar Odom, one of the hip hop greats of all time, like, you know, growing up, like we were glued to Yo MTV raps and MC Light was a fixture, <laughs> right? On Yo MTV raps. With sure was. Ed Lover, Dr. Dre, and, and you know, Fab Five Freddy. And then like the um, Lamar Odom, like how, how do you do that? How, how do you get that? How do you, I mean, that's crazy. Well, the blessing of this coronavirus is a lot of people are on social media now more than ever. And as a digital content creator, it actually increased my time being on social media. And to answer your question directly, my mindset is I'm just going to shoot my shot. I'm going to shoot my shot. I don't care if I don't necessarily, you know, score it. That's something that I probably wish I would have developed when I was a little younger, especially playing, you know, basketball. Sometimes I was a little timid and I couldn't just be me. But I took the mindset of learning from my mistakes when I was younger. And I said, as I got a little older, I wasn't going to be afraid to shoot anything now. At this point, I'm going to reach out and do what I know I can do. And as a result of that, I started to score. And, you know, you know this as a basketball player. All you need to do is just a lot of times just see one of them go in. Once you see one of them go in, now you're like, oh, I can really do this. <laughs> and that's how my mindset has always been. And so once I got Lamar Odom, that's when it really hit me like, man, that's pretty cool. But I actually – you know, got people that were significantly just as big oh, leading yeah. up to, you know, him. And I was just like, wow, you know, if I can get one of these people, I can get somebody else. So to answer your question directly, how do I do it? I just shoot my shot. You connect with them over Instagram or Facebook and you send, you, you send them a DM, you like their post. Is that kind of like the. That's kind of the gist of it. A lot of times what I do is I will reach out to them directly but most of the time because they're such a you know big time person they're not going to be able to check their dms or something but sometimes you look up and they actually do and once you got them to either like the comment or once you got them to either you know look at some of your work you're in there and then they'll connect they'll help you get connected to the people that can ultimately help you do what you're trying to do and my mindset is i'm going to shoot these shots don't get me wrong but I'm also going to need a little bit of help. You know, the way I see it is back when I was playing ball, a lot of times I was just in the gym shooting by myself and eventually you get a rebounder. But even if that rebounder doesn't come, you still got to put the work in and shoot the ball. Well, that's how I've adapted to, you know, me doing my whole show. Don't get me wrong. As much as I would like to still, you know, build relationships with these managers and PRs, if they don't want to help me, I just got to do it on my own. Yeah. Now you got me excited about the analogies because <laughs> and I don't want to get I don't want to go back to the basketball conversation. By the way, <laughs> at this stage of my life, I'm I'm more regulated toward, towards a facilitator and a, and a spot up shooter <laughs> as opposed to it, but I haven't lost the game in my driveway yet either. I know that's right, man. My Defend my kids, your home court. My kids come at me. 11, 9, 7, and I got I beat him one time with the three year he was two at the time and I beat him with one hand <laughs> and I sent them both off crying. Um and you're right. That's how you got to do it, man. You gotta <laughs> make them learn. <laughs> yeah, you do. And um, you know, I, I, I find it to be, you know, you what you do say though is that I do find a lot of the things that I've learned from athletics transitioning over. And you do have to obviously take your shot. You're gonna you're gonna a lot of times missed more than you make. And I find it fascinating that you're able to have that, um, I don't mean this in a negative way, but that bulldog mentality, right? To go after it because it's not just going to, you know, you, you got a body of work and it's a solid body of work, but in the same note, like, it's not like every day people are gonna pick you up and like, Chris, well, like this was amazing. Can you come interview, you know, uh -huh. the next celebrity? Like you have got to do your work and outreach to in order to be able to get those interviews sure do 
Sure do. And that's something that I don't take for granted either, because it's no secret, you know, coming from Youngstown, Ohio, we have to get it what's called out of the mud. Most people forget at one point this was a top five city. Well, those days are long gone. Those days are over with. Those days are just not coming back, at least not right now. So what we have to do is always remember where we come from. But that should also give you a chip on your shoulder to say, if I can make it here, I really can make it anywhere. Or if I can survive here, then I can survive anywhere. I can survive being told no, but I will never survive not trying. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I left I left Youngstown for, for college uh, and then from there went to Cleveland, to New York City, then to Columbus and moved back about eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And I kind of always approached it with kind of that, that I approached it definitely with that mentality. First of all, I'm, I'm short. I was, I played a sport that I wasn't supposed to necessarily play or excel at. Um, I actually had to walk on my four year college. So they had recruited five guys to play ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And one was an all American when he was a senior. So like I was fine backing up that I I don't want to say it was fine, but I understood like he was an all American and he was going to help bring me along too. And that created that chip on the shoulder, right? This guy's scholarship, and I'm not supposed to be there. I'm going to, and my, you said something earlier that like, you know, validate, like my whole career is a basically a, an, an example of, of failure and somebody closing a door on me. So mm-hmm. like I submit to speak at marketing conferences all the time and I don't get in. So I, I created my own. Um, I, I, I would work in a job and I tried to get a, um, an executive position as a marketing person. And I would, I would get like every excuse under the sun, like why I wasn't qualified. So I was like, screw it, start my own company. I'll be my own boss. I know that's right. You know, and so when I did, when I was living here and there and I would meet people, I never said I was from a place in between Cleveland and Pittsburgh, or I lived near Pittsburgh. I I grew up near Cleveland. I'd say I'm from Youngstown, Ohio. Uh You say that in Cleveland or you say that in New York, there's, there's a a stigma that comes along with that. And I always felt like I had to represent my hometown because I knew I was going back there. And when I say Youngstown, I think we, I, I look at Youngstown as the region, you know, it's the, it's the major city, you know, we grew up in different areas, but like, it's the major city. It's where I'm from. It's part of the DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, so you use that as motivation. All the way. To, to continually advance, to prove that you could get interviews, that you've got the talent um, that, that continues to push you along. And that serves as your motive, one, one of your motivating factors to keep grinding, keep hustling. It does. It does because the same way that I look at it from a perspective of, you know, we got to see things as the big picture. You know, you want to see things for what they are and you don't want to get stuck at where you're at now, because if you get stuck at where you're at now, you'll never get to ultimately your main goal, which is the bigger picture, but you still have to have the motivation behind it to keep working. My motivation was I'm going to become so good at what I do or I'm going to work so hard. The same people that turned me down and said I wasn't good enough, they're going to see me again and they're going to say, I just can't get rid of this kid. And that has always been my motive. And I think I'm just at a point in my young career now where I'm just getting my feet wet, but I still haven't really touched the surface of what I know I can become. Technique wise, when, when you're, when you're doing an interview, and I think that this is some valuable information for the, for the people that are dropping by. And then, then when we repurpose this to our audience, your preparation that goes into an interview, how much background information do you try to get on somebody prior to you interviewing that individual? I try to get as much as possible. You know, Mm -hmm. I try to either watch previous interviews they've already done or read up on them a little bit so I can have somewhat of an idea of who I'm talking to. But the most interesting thing is, as far as the questions, I'll have certain talking points, but I don't just write out all of my questions because there has to be some kind of authenticity. You know, it has to be real. I can't rehearse my questions I'm going to ask somebody because now that takes away from what I do like it has to be real with me it has to be authentic it has to be genuine it has to be real 
That's the, well, so, you know, it's funny that you say that because I wrote down like three things that I wanted to ask you, but I knew that there was like a ton of follow-up in, in response to your question or to your answers, right? I wanted to dig deeper. And I, I, I think that that's, uh, you know, that obviously that makes a, a ton of sense. Now, what do you do? Like, you're a great interview. Thank now, you. I mean, you're, you're a great interview because you, you articulate and you give answers, right? You're easy to talk to. Appreciate I, it. Have you ever had anybody on that you ask a question with depth and you get an answer like, yeah. Yes, I have. And it is <laughs> by far one of the most driest answers. And you're doing your best to stay professional, but you're thinking, God, dog it, will you just answer the question with some more depth? And they don't do it, but I have to keep level-headed and I have to remember I'm there to do a job. Yeah. I'm there to do the best I can do. And sometimes, like I said, it's like hit and miss with some of these people. Sometimes the interviews they give you are great. And other times you're like, okay, did you wake up on the wrong side of bed? Right. Like it, it's very, it's difficult, you know, to, uh, and it could be just the day. Like somebody may have just found out something like an hour before the interview and they decide to go through with it. You know, I always try to empathize with the, the person that I'm having a discussion with. And, but, um, you know, it's interesting when you ask somebody like a question and you don't get much response and now you're sitting there going, and it's that on, awkward like, silence. Give me, give me something to work with. <laughs> it's that awkward silence for like three to five seconds. You're like, okay, I got to hurry and jump back in here now. Yeah. So on that note, types of questions that you, you asked, do you ever get people, especially in the celebrity world that they're like, you kind of have like, Hey, Chris, don't ask questions about X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So a lot of times what I, and this is something I also had to learn too, is whenever you are doing the interview, we always have what's called the pre-tape. What the pre-tape is, you ask them right now, is there anything that you do not want me to hit on? Because they have to be able to trust you and they have to be able to make sure that they hold you accountable because you're still, you're still there to do a job. So if we have already talked off camera and I said, I'm not going to ask this, you can be 1 million percent sure when we're on camera, I will not ask it because I don't want this to get out. And you tell your people, well, he's not who he says he is. You know, he's not a good person to interview with because he's going to, you know, sure. basically not do his job. If he said he's not going to ask you this and he asks you it, now you're presented as somebody that is not basically a liar because you just lied to me right then and there. And I don't want to be known as that person. So there is not one person who I've ever interviewed from college till now as God is my witness that can say, well, he said he wasn't going to ask this, but he asked it. There is not one interview I did where they can say that. Mm -hmm. And so as far as um, technique goes, you do some research. Um, you obviously have a pre-call. Um, these questions, a lot of them open-ended, closed-ended. How, how do you how do you formulate like some of the things that you think you're going to ask that are going to gain interest and dialogue from the people that you're interviewing that re will resonate potentially with your audience? It all depends on how I feel the interview is going. It depends on how I can, you know, I can kind of discern whether I should ask this person about this or I should not ask this person this. It's all about the vibe. The vibe has to be there. The energy has to be there. And the articulation of answers have to be there as well. You know, if I'm asking somebody a question and they're giving me short worded answers, okay, I, I can't really dig as deep as I want to. But if they're willing to elaborate on their answers, then maybe I can start asking more questions that will ultimately make this interview a success. And I'll actually reveal something on here that I've never really talked about publicly is a lot of times when I'm doing the interview with the person, I'm not only am I filling them out, but I'm also thinking, what can I ask next? And then boom, it just comes out. And I know it comes from above because I don't really prepare any questions. It just flows. Ba -ba -ba. Do you like <laughs> breaking news? <laughs> no, I it's you the know truth, though, yeah. It, 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 and I and I hear you because sometimes, like, what I'm thinking on the next thing, and I'm also trying to listen in this year of what you're saying. But then my the brain, the, the my little hamster starts running. I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. I gotta ask Chris this next, but I gotta let him finish the thought because I I do have that that follow up already in mind. Now, is this a feel? It sounds like it's a feel thing. I don't want to assume that, but then it's also, is it a natural 
nature thing or something that you've also learned along the way? A little bit of both. You know, nobody comes out the gate firing unless you're just one of the rare exceptions. But I still have definitely had to learn. I've had to learn interview techniques. I've had to learn interview styles. And if you can tell, even in the way that my interviews come off when I first started, I just use my phone. I just use the phone and a janky tripod. But as time goes on, you can see the development. Now I have mics, I have lights. You know, I'm in a suit and tie for almost every interview that I do because there has to be progression. So the way that I had to progress with my appearance and with my audio and with my sound, I also had to progress with my questions, the way that I do it. Anytime you see me, I want you to always say he really has gotten better since the last time that I've seen him. Now, what, now what's the equipment situation? That the equi you, yeah, what's the equipment situation mm -hmm. that you utilize? And what, what would you tell people that are looking to start a live or a podcast? What do they, they kind of need even bare bones? I would tell them, first of all, get ready to spend some money. You know, uh, if you want to do this the right way, you're going to have to spend a little bit of more than $20. But I guarantee you, you will be happy with what it comes out with. I would recommend getting lights, getting a LED light, getting maybe photography lights or a ring light, because I know those things work, you know, wonders. I would, I would strongly suggest that they get a tripod, they get a stabilizer. And they get something compatible for their phone if that's what they decide to go with. Now, if they want to go the other route and use cameras, by all means, go right ahead. Yeah. But in this day and age, everything is really on our phones now. Like you can legit shoot a full fledged feature film on an iPhone, which is still crazy, but you can do it. So if you can just use everything from your iPhone, hey, by all means, go right ahead. And yeah, no, no, there's no doubt. And that's, that's, that's a good piece of advice to, I think, share with people that are out there. Um, it's as simple as picking up a phone these days or how, how, you know, how good they are. Um, what is there an end game in mind? Absolutely. My end game is to be on ESPN. There is no if, ands, or buts, but that, that is my biggest, because when I was a kid, I used to watch Stuart Scott. I used to watch how he would, somewhat do the ESPN anchor news and then he would do the interviews with the players and say cool as the other side of pillow or yes boom like butter baby you know something like that and then I will go and watch Chris Broussard and then I will watch Stephen A. Smith now I'm watching Chris Broussard again and Stephen A but I'm also watching uh, Skip Bayless and Shannon Sharp and then I'm also watching Kerry Champion and uh, I'm also watching Jamel Hill on Vice Sports on Vice TV and all I could think is man I can see me doing all of this and it wouldn't make any sense if I'm doing this just for the heck of it. No, there's an end game. My end game is to end up like them. But on the flip side, I'm so blessed at what I do is that I can do more than one genre. I can do sports, but I can also do entertainment. I can do comedy. I can do drama if I really wanted to. And I'm just grateful because God has given me such a gift that I cannot be boxed into just one thing. However, you know, whichever contract comes first, and if that money's looking right, then I mean, hey, we got to do what we got to do. Yeah, right. No doubt. That's, you know, and good for you. And I, I have a follow up to that, but it's a funny story. When I was living in New York City, I uh, met some friends of mine for some adult beverages down in the West Village and <laughs> in walks Stuart Scott and Stephen A. Smith. Now, to put that in the context, like I'm thinking like I moved to New York in like 2002, 2003. So this is a long, long time ago at this point. Right. But like and I was never too starstruck. And I, I want to get into that in just a second because I dropped Martha Stewart <laughs> earlier. I was never too starstruck. I had to handle a lot of celebrities in New York City in the healthcare business that I was in. And I can count on a, on a hand, like one hand, like I always gave celebrities or it's not the cool thing to do in New York to go approach me. But like Stuart Scott and Stephen A walked in and there was just something about the group of guys I was hanging out with that they, he just had to give them a shout out. <laughs> like they were super cool. <laughs> like, like, yo, like, boo, yeah. And then we started like, you know, there's like a bunch of drunken sailors and they're going to a VIP party. And we're like, yeah. <laughs> you ever get starstruck? No, I don't, believe it or not. And um, don't get me wrong, I'm nervous before I conduct the interview, but as far as starstruck is because they're human beings just like we are. You know, God forbid, if you cut them, they're going to bleed the same color. 
you know, they still got to wake up and brush their teeth in the morning just like we do. So now I don't get starstruck. I respect who they are, but I'm not afraid of anybody. You know, I, I don't get starstruck and be like, oh, my goodness, there goes LeBron. Or Now, don't don't get me wrong. You'll, you might feel a little bit of butterflies for a hot second, but I'm the kind of person just by nature, even back when I played basketball, if somebody was projected as to be the best player, my mindset was, okay, and so am I. And once we roll this ball out, you're going to think I'm pretty dang good, too. So when I do these interviews with these people, they might have done a million other interviews. But once they get done with me, I want them to say, yeah, that kid was good. Yeah. Yeah, I think a, and that's that that's awesome. And I think that a lot of that, too, comes back to our area. It my, does. I mean, my dad was just always like you put everybody wakes up and puts their pants on one leg at a time. And I always used to think of myself like, does somebody jump? <laughs> and like put them on both at the same time yeah, man. maybe pops like he seems but he's like one leg at a time and then like that always stuck with me from a little kid like it it never I would you know I never really like I don't know it just always kept me grounded like yeah you're right like so you're you're exactly right now I know that you're um from doing my homework here I know that you are a big Kobe Bryant fan yes sir and and so Talk to me a little bit about Mamba mentality and how, you know, you being a fan of Kobe, um, you know, rough week, you know, and I, I can, you know, I think it'll be always be one of those moments where mm -hmm. I know where I was, um, you know, at my house. And when you, when you find out that just the, the, it, the horrible information that I still, I think, continue to process today and mm -hmm. probably the only posthumous star that I've ever felt that connection with, like, so talk, talk to me a little bit about what Kobe meant to you and still does today. Kobe meant so much to me because as a kid, he was the first basketball player that I really connected with. Don't get me wrong. You know, my dad had me watch a lot of old Magic Johnson highlights and a lot of Michael Jordan tapes and Isaiah Thomas, a.k.a. Zeke. But there was just something about Kobe that I really loved. I loved how he was so aggressive. I love how he brought it every single night. He looked forward to guarding the whoever the best player was. And he also looked forward to taking the big shots and making them. And when I think about, you know, his life in general, first of all, I don't think he gets enough credit or enough consideration for the GOAT talk, but that's a conversation for a different day. <laughs> uh, that's just, you know, my is that, plug. Is that when we start our basketball podcast? Man, just saying, you know, I just feel like you do have a sports podcast. I do, I do, I and I've do. not been invited to be on it yet, so I'm gonna, Don't. I'm gonna continue to like to <laughs> position myself for that invite. But anyway, I got ahead. you, man. We can set some, we can set that up. But yeah, man, it's just so cool how you know Kobe's life impacted so many people. And when I was a kid, I had the number eight jersey. I had the Kobe twos. When I played ball, I wanted to be like Kobe. And, you know, his mindset of just approaching everything, you know, Kobe's mindset was so reckless and not in a bad way, but he wanted to give it everything he had. That's why you see him in his last game. He could barely walk after because he gave it everything he possibly could. He was, you know, ready to let it go and walk away. And to me, the mama mentality just means giving it your all, you know, giving it every single thing that, you know, you can possibly give and feeling OK with the results. I know that sounds extremely cliche. And I know when people say, if you give it your best, you can live with the results. You really can because, you know, deep down inside, you gave it your all. You possibly can't give anything else. But to be able to muster up that kind of effort and energy for over 20 years, playing for the greatest organization of all time, and to be arguably the greatest Laker, winning five chips under the circumstances that you want them in, you have to want to be inspired by that. And to see that he inspired so many people, not just in the United States, but around the world. The world shut down once Kobe died. And I hate to say it, but it's the God's honest truth. The world has not been the same since Kobe Bryant died either. Yeah, you know, it, it's, um, I, I have a neighbor that plays baseball at Youngstown State University and had a hell of a high school career. Um, scored 1,800 points in high school. Um, Man. Probably played both in college. And he plays, he plays baseball at YSU. He's a, he's a tremendous athlete, even better person. Mm -hmm. And we, he and I talk a lot about sports and athletics and he works with my kids. He lives a block away. So like they are luck, they have the luxury of running over there and, 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 you know, getting shooed home after they bother him so much. <laughs> <laughs> and then they should, right. Like, but 
you know, we were talking about like Kobe and it's just like, he threw, you know, he's throwing up a thousand jumpers a day, not for that season, but for season number 10, 15, 20, like, right. Like that in its own right, like uh, hearing stories of how he, he worked on a turnaround jumper for the elbow for like an hour and a half, like, or knowing that somebody walked in the gym, um, Somebody, knowing somebody walked in the gym for the pregame routine, he was already there sweating and he stayed there, watched, worked out the whole time they worked out for an hour. And then after they left, he made sure that he stayed there. Like that, that, those types of things are crazy to hear. Right. I have an amazing Kobe Bryant story. So I never met Kobe personally, but mm -hmm. I got to see greatness up close and personal in new Orleans in a random, like January, February game. That pretty <laughs> much means nothing to everybody. And I was, I mean, I'm really lucky. Like I was traveling for a corporate job and some guys from a, a vendor bought tickets and we literally sat 10 rows up in new Orleans mm -hmm. and it's, it's probably a Tuesday or Wednesday night. And like, what's the motivation there? Like, you know, it's just right. It's just a Wednesday night, new Orleans. I think new Orleans was a dog. The Lakers were having a decent season and Kobe comes down and he, uh, he starts yelling first at his teammates in the huddle. <laughs> and I'm like, uh Oh, this had to be good. Like he's mad about something. <laughs> and then like a few minutes later, like he then starts yelling at the referee by the end of the first start of the second quarter. Like he's just on the referee. Like, and, <laughs> and I'm like watching him get worked up into a frenzy. And I'm like, this is interesting. He's yelling at his team. He's yelling at the refs. And then, and then somebody did something stupid for New Orleans. Somebody set him off that he was, you could see him visibly from my seat yelling at other guys on the other team. And he was, they were down 15 and he takes over the game. It's one of the last <laughs> great games that he played before he blew out his Achilles. He drops 47 in a win in New Orleans and brings them back. And not only that competitiveness, but then like you're looking, watching pros and then you're watching this other pro elevate by these other pros with speed and ability and fundamentals, which I think is highly overlooked by a lot of professional athletes. It sure is. And the IQ. Like you're like other guys are running full speed. And how is Kobe running faster than these other guys with the ball in his hand? It was, it was like, and I never, that always stuck with me. And then he got, he blew out the Achilles like one or two games later. Ah, still hard to watch that tape. Hard to watch that tape. And that, that to me was the night that I learned after a lifelong history of, of athletics and sport and basketball, there's a difference between greatness and just like everybody else. Yeah, there really is. That's why he's always been my favorite player. And to me, I said a couple of days ago, the three greatest players to ever play the game, in my opinion, are Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Kobe Bryant. Yeah. I think they're the three greatest, and it's not even with all due respect to people like Bill Russell and Larry Bird and Kareem. I just feel like those three elevated the game. And, yeah, people can try and make the argument saying that, well, Kobe just copied Mike. Well, guess what? That was a dang good copy because he almost he almost counted them in rings, and I don't care nobody says. Kobe should have had more than one MVP. Nash, there's no way Steve Nash should have beat him out for M MVP. Was it twice? Twice. Yeah. He beat out – he beat out – Kobe and Shaq for MVP, and they yeah. didn't even sniff the finals with so, a healthy Amari Stoudemire and Sean Marion. Here, here's, here's what we need to do to have the follow-up, because I have another player in mind that I need to insert into that top three. Uh -oh. that never needed to, <laughs> never, never had to learn how to win. You hear that a lot in the NBA. You like, do. Mike had to learn how to win against Detroit, had to go through Detroit, right? And the one guy that never had a problem learning how to win was magic, right? He wins a high school state championship. Sure did. In a, in a four-year period, he goes from winning a state championship to an NCAA championship to an NBA championship and plays in the finals <laughs> every year through the 80s. So, like, <laughs> I, like, struggle with I, – I get caught up. I get uh -huh. caught up in – that team I, and, and that's not even fair to say because because all those guys are great team players 
They are. They're and all great I team think, players. I think Magic is the greatest leader of all time. I think he's the greatest point guard of all time as well, just because Magic's ability to get everybody involved and make it look so good doing it was the greatest thing we've ever seen at that time. Now you got a guys like LeBron who could pass behind his back and, you know, Chris Paul, one of the greatest floor generals of all time. But in terms of just, you know, really, and and I think what you can also say is basketball is a game of evolution. You know, we didn't get a chance to see that in the sixties and in the sixties with Bob Cousy, you didn't get a chance to see that in like the seventies with Nate tiny ultra ball. But in the eighties, you saw a six, nine point guard make passing look so cool. And now here you are in the modern era and everybody can pass the ball like that and make it look, you know, great. But you don't get those without magic, just like in terms of just dominance. You don't get those without Kobe, Michael and LeBron James. Absolutely. So uh, switching gears for here for just a moment, we're coming up on the top of the hour. We've got Chris Gunther, the Chris Gunther show on Facebook, Facebook Live and YouTube channel as well. Make sure that you guys Subscribe, dial in, tune in. Chris is doing great things, not just interviewing celebrities, which is obviously very impressive, but giving a lot of the local business community a voice as well. Um, one of the things that we've done at Do Yo Live since our inception is we, we try to interview as many business owners as we possibly can. We also utilize the platform, especially our in-person event, to give people like Chris an opportunity to come and speak. Um, and, and try and help them, you know, as best as we can to put them on display. Cause I think that we have incredibly talented people here in Youngstown, Ohio. And I think you're one of them. Um, talk to me a little bit about, I want to, I want to finish up with that. You off air, we talked a little bit about what you're wearing today as well as a tribute. And then we've got rapid fire questions. So talk to me a little bit about some of the local interviews that you've done or are in the process of doing that help local business out owners out, get some awareness for, for what they're doing. One of them that comes to mind right off the bat is Jessica Morales from Vieira's Vision. And what she does is she's a photographer and she can literally make anything work. I've seen this woman transform her studio into making it become a place where you step in. And even though you might say you're just taking pictures, once you get those pictures back, you'll say, wow, like these came out much better than I thought they were. Mm -hmm. And we did an interview back in April of 2019. It was our very first time meeting. And she shared with me her vision. She shared with me what she wanted to do. And I came by and did the interview with her. It got very good reviews. People loved it. And she actually is the one who took my engagement photos with my fiance. And those things got over 900 views, which is pretty impressive. And I remember just, you know, telling her, now you realize once these pictures get out, your phone is probably going to be ringing off the hook. And she was like, I'm ready. I'm like, all right. So we shared it. And next thing you know, she got crazy book and she still book crazy till this day. So that is just somewhat of a result of what happens when somebody interviews with me and they have a pretty, you know, good vision or pretty good following. So people like Jessica, Jessica, for, uh, yeah, people like Jessica, uh, who else have I chopped it up with? Because I've done some pretty cool people around here. I'm very grateful for it. But she's probably the first one that comes to my mind. So if you guys are in need of somebody to come and, you know, take some pictures for her, her name is Jessica Morales at Vieira's Vision. And, uh, yeah, you guys will not be disappointed. She's one of the first people I can think of. And you, you I don't want to say recruit, but you, you on your Facebook feed say, who would you like to see me interview next? Like you ask your audience, like, who would you mm -hmm. like to see interview? I'm still waiting for somebody to drop my name in there. <laughs> what, Man, you know, I think that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> so, um, and by the way, so we are going to come back. I I'm very hopeful that we're going to come back in 2021 with an in-person event. And, I and I'm going to stick to my word that a lot of the people that are committing to the virtual that will get the opportunity to speak in person. But I think that what I'd like to do is that you and I connect. And I think that it'd be an awesome opportunity uh, to see what type of interest you'd have to actually interviewing people at our next do you <laughs> putting that, that talent to work. <laughs> so, Wait, what a way to do it. Yeah. Let's make it happen. Captain. <laughs> right. Exactly. Uh, 
but we're having some conversations now about bringing it back in 2021. Now, your tribute today, what do you got on? So I'm wearing a yellow shirt and I'm doing this as a tribute to my big sister, Darnell Clark, who is currently battling uh, COVID-19 like so many other people are. And once I first heard it, first of all, I just shook my head and said, no, not her. But after, you know, me thinking in disbelief, I said, if there's one person who I know can beat this is Darnell. And she actually is a school teacher at Liberty. She, I want to say, teaches the first grade and the impact that she's had on that entire Liberty community is priceless. So once the coronavirus happened, obviously kids can't go back to school. So what Darnell did was she created Clark's Cozy Corner, where she actually reads stories, but she dresses up in the characters and she brings those characters to life as she's reading it. And she went viral. You know, now she's getting monetized from YouTube as a result of her doing those. And even outside of that, she is just a terrific individual a special person. Dennis, I kid you not, you'll meet her one time and feel like you've known her forever because that's just how nice she is. Yeah. And in this world, we all need at least one nice person like to at least help us out or encourage us. And if there's one person who I know can make the difference in this world, it's definitely Darnell. So that's why I'm wearing yellow. I'm actually working a game tonight and I'm going to rock something and I'm dedicating my entire broadcast to Darnell tonight. That's awesome, man. Well, thoughts and prayers um, and, uh, you know, get through that thing, man, because we know a lot of people that have been impacted by it. The most important thing is the health. You know, we, we, we lost a lot of business in 2020, but mm -hmm. if we don't have our health. We can't make it back up again. You know what I mean? So get healthy, stay healthy, prayers and thoughts there. All right. So we end, we're going to end this with rapid fire questions with you. Got it. All right. Ready? Let's go. Let's go. All right. What's on your desk? What's on your desk at home? My desk at home. I got my Bible. I got my microphones and I got my notebook as into like what I'm trying to do next. Apple or Android? Apple. What's on your home screen? My fiance. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. Always <laughs> and forever. All right. Um, Rock, rap, or country? Rap, hands you, down. I grew up in the night. I grew up in the nineties. Okay. I was like, grew up in the nineties, man. So rap and hip hop all day, man. Um, um, your all time. You you got to go to the playground. Me and you are going to the playground. I'm picking. Mm -hmm. We're picking up squads. We're gonna play five <laughs> on five. I'm coming out of retirement. <laughs> Wooden four. Four guys you're running with. Now, can these be like professional players or just guys I played with back in high school or in general? Do you want to win? <laughs> <laughs> All right. If I'm going, I, I, I can do this either way. So just let me know. Like, can I pick <laughs> professional or local? Which one you want me to do? I I, I think you got to go. I think you got to go pro. Pro? Okay. Well, um, assuming everybody's alive and healthy. You know, <laughs> I'm definitely getting Kobe. I'm playing point guard. I'm going to get Kobe at the two. I'm going to actually, no, I'm going Allen Iverson at, at two. I'm going AI at two. I'm going Kobe at three. I'm getting LeBron at four. I'm getting Shaq at five. Ouch. Yeah, that's a, that's a good squad. <laughs> Yep, and I'm gonna just pass the ball like here. You guys go ahead. I'm gonna just <laughs> you know, watch y'all go to work, and then I'm gonna jump on somebody's shoulders and take a picture like this. I might, I might be, I might be yelling at guys waiting on the sideline, saying, "Who's gonna, who wants to pick me up? Who's got next? Can I get next?" You know, when the game's still going on, it's the worst feeling in the world. Guys are trying to get next. It's like, finish your game, man. All right. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny because I remember. And I'm telling y'all something like something else, too, that I've never really talked about. So I remember going to college, you know, at YSU's rec center in the first couple of weeks of the semester. Everybody used to be at the rec. And most people didn't know I was a basketball player because I was actually extremely quiet. So I would be kind of sitting around hoping I could get picked up. And as God is my witness, whenever I got picked up, my team, we didn't lose for the rest of the day. 
And throughout my college journey, when, it, when like whenever I went to the rec center, I barely lost. It's one of the most gratifying feelings in the world. It is. <laughs> and, and, it really and I'm not going to lie, because there's a lot of courts that I showed up on. And, you know, I mean, look, like, five eight on a phone book and they're just like just regardless <laughs> like back in the day i was either hurley or stockton i was like oh why i gotta be hurley or stockton like can i <laughs> like my game wasn't hurley or stockton it was more kenny anderson i thought and i was like you know like give me a break but i always felt it gratifying that once i got on i ne usually never left and it is a gratifying feeling especially then, oh it's, when i showed back I love up it. again and then when you showed back up again then you had built up a little bit of a reputation, but man, was it a pain in the butt getting on that first game of like it was. four, five. You're like, are we going to, are they going to quit playing before I actually get on to get on the game? Hey. Man, I remember my very last semester of school. Um, I had went to the court. I'm like 22 at this point. So senior in college, you're still young, but you're not like 18 at this point. Right. And I played a couple games. It was me and my team versus these incoming freshmen. And believe it or not, I couldn't make a shot at all in the first two games. And somebody started trash talking me. And I overheard somebody on the sideline going, uh-oh. And as God is my witness, I didn't miss another shot the rest of the game. Uh, the rest of the day, we just blew every, everybody out. <laughs> and as I'm walking out, somebody was like, that's what happens when you talk stuff to Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be careful then. Um, Good time, man. <laughs> yeah, maybe we put together a charity game. We'll raise some money for some something. Let's do it. Let's let's do that, man. Let's let's do that all the way. Let's let's set that up for. Uh, well, if we could set up the summer, that would be incredible. It but would be if, incredible. You know, COVID is still unfortunately still here, and we have to buy by the guidelines. But I'm always down to you know lace them up for a good cause and just meet some people smile and laugh and just have a good time let's let's definitely do that let me know what i can do to help all right let's figure that out all right i'm not done with rapid fire questions so it's all right. no more, <laughs> no, more bad, no i'm joking i'm joking okay all right so now here's the most controversial question mm -hmm. that you're gonna get on any interview that you're going to participate in maybe ever <laughs> Are you ready? It's heavy. Go ahead. Okay. Best pizza in Youngstown. Oh, yeah. That's a, good one. that's a good one. That's a good one. Well, let's see. My best friend is a manager at Marco's, so she significantly looks out for your boy. But Marco's yeah. is a franchise pizza all over. So let's see. If I had to go with the best pizza in Youngstown, it's a toss-up between Bellaria and Wedgwood. Tossed up between Bellaria and Wedgwood, but I'm gonna give the nod. I'm gonna give the nod to Bellaria. It's a, it, there. You go. You heard it from. You heard it from Chris first. Bellaria is in, in, in his <laughs> one shot. We're gonna have a celebrity charity basketball event with Bellaria Pizza sponsored. Uh, yeah, on, let's do that. Bellaria, if you're watching, this, sponsor us. And then, um, last question I have. This could be business or other personal wise. Best piece of advice you've either been given or you give best piece of advice I've ever been given, man, that's a great one too. I would say the best piece of advice I've ever gotten from my dad was when I was a kid. And sometimes we used to be playing basketball and I couldn't make a shot or I was getting double teamed or whatever the case was. And I would get a little down my father, a lot of times, first of my dad was not like Joe Jackson, all right, where if you miss a shot, he's going to beat the brakes off you, okay? My pops wasn't like that. But a lot of times what my dad would do is, <laughs> you know, my dad would sometimes take me by the jersey and be like, boy, look here, roll them sleeves up and get back out there and keep going. You know, my father wasn't the kind of person who was, uh, <laughs> it's funny, all this stuff was coming back to me now as I'm older. My dad wasn't the kind of person that would beat you for every little thing, you know, because my, my my pops really didn't beat us a whole lot. But when he would get on us, he would tell me, look here, boy, you a Gunther. Roll them sleeves up and get back out there and play and stop all that crying. And that's what I really have taken at this point in my life. When life gets hard, roll them sleeves up and keep going. So that's the best advice I've ever gotten from my dad. And the best advice I've given to anyone is never give up. Never give up because... Say, for instance, you're 
breakthrough or everything that you worked hard for was right on the opposite. You know, say if it was right there, but you quit. And once you quit, you never know what can happen because you gave up. So the best advice I will ever give somebody is never give up. That's that's solid advice, man. And I, I love what you say there. It helps to validate. I've got young kids and, you know, they've got life and they've got sport and they've luckily have inherited my wife's athletic ability. We talk about, you know, we were on the way home from a baseball game and, and, and two years ago, my, my son, he was starting out. It was pretty competitive and he was striking out. And he's like, when am I going to start hitting the ball? And I said, I don't know. I said, I really don't know. I can't, I'm not going to lie to you. I like, I don't know. But mm-hmm. I do know this. There's a difference between good and great and good gives up and great keeps going. And we're, we're we'll go get in the, we'll go do whatever we got to do to put the work in to fix this. Roll your sleeves up, young man. That's what I'm going to start saying from now on. But like I always say, good versus great. Great keeps going. Everybody's every, good. Good's like, ah, and good kind of just gives up along the way, you know? Sure does. Yeah. Sure does. I, I, I can still remember my district championship run that I had with Ursland. And my dad was kind of getting on me because at that time I, I wasn't really shooting as much as I should have. Like I was, you know, very good coming off the bench, producing, either playing some great defense, you know, keeping the offense rolling if I got my chance, shoot it. And my dad used to kind of get on me like, Chris, man, you got to shoot the ball. Like you, you guys aren't going to win if if you don't contribute some kind of offense. And I remember there was one particular play, uh, I think it was my teammate Kyrie Gregory, he was driving and he kicked it over to me. Now, mind you, this is a district championship game, so the gym is packed. You know, this is life before the coronavirus. The gym is packed, and I catch it, and I shoot it. And, you know, as a you know, you're a father, so you know this probably better than anybody. When your kid does something, you're going to smile, and you're going to be happy. And, you know, you're, I, I'm not sure if you're that dad that goes wild at the games. Well, my dad wasn't necessarily that guy, right? But this particular time, my dad just became the loudest person there. And as soon as I made the shot, the first person I heard yell and scream was my dad. And my dad goes, yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I did something right, man. I did something right. <laughs> that, 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 you know, that's outstanding. Uh, I could, I could relate on so many levels. And, and now as a dad in the stands, like I've coached my kids in flag football in baseball and i really have been hands off kind of reluctant about basketball Uh because of the sport that i played (laughs) and i coach and i know so much about it and and i and and then like i try to let the coaches do their job because i know how it is coaching youth sports but one day like we were at practice and the guys working with the kids on free throws and i'm sitting there biting my lip (laughs) (laughs) right because when i dropped my kids i was like have fun listen to your coach work hard you know those are the instructions right and I go, get in the car, <laughs> get in the driveway, listen to me. Like, like, but we're in a game. Um, when they're playing a game, I am, uh, I get mad about the little things. I don't, I don't have too much expression when they make a, my boy's been making a, a working on some moves, uh, shot fake cross up down the middle, shoot the Tony Parker two two hands. Yeah, man, We've been working on that, right? right. We've been working on that. He did it last game. And I was like, ah, he's, 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 he's putting it into play. But when he's d up and he doesn't keep a guy on one side of the floor, mm-hmm. I go nuts. I'm like, how do <laughs> you let this guy, I'm yelling, don't let him drive middle on you. Don't let him drive. How does he come, stay on the high side. So I get, that's when I get crazy as a dad. <laughs> oh, man, them kids going to have a lot of fun playing for you, but they're going to have a lot of fun. People are looking at me in the stands like, what are you talking about? And I'm like, oh, I, I don't even want to, you know, they're yelling three seconds. I'm like, that's low hanging <laughs> fruit, brother. Like, <laughs> let the kids be kids. <laughs> anyway, Chris, I really appreciate you dropping on by. Um, it, it's been a fun interview. I look forward to packaging this back up again. We're live back every Friday for about the next, uh, I think we're about halfway through on the Do You Live virtual sessions. And uh, so look for the replay of this. Uh, We're going to get it out. Make sure that you follow Chris Gunther. He's doing great things uh, nationally and in the city of Youngstown. He's one of our our talented gems. 
and uh, we just appreciate it, man. So thank you for all that you're doing. Keep up, roll your sleeves up, man. Keep up at it and, and being a reminder to all of us as well to keep doing it as well. So thank you. Thank you for your time today, man. I appreciate it. Be sure you guys like and share and subscribe to the Do Yo Live Facebook page, all that good stuff. Dennis, thank you for your time today, man. Greatly appreciate it. We'll see you, man. Later.